working on Twitch. Come on, come on. How's it going, Christopher? All right, seems to be working on YouTube, and now we just got the last one here to check on x.com. That's where all the cool kids are now. All right, here we go. Uh, still got to wait for this x.com. Maybe not. All right, we'll give it a second. How's it going, John? How's it going, Chris? You guys are also cool. Yeah, I'd prefer YouTube to X, but there's a really big community of like AI ML people on Twitter or X. So it kind of just makes sense from a channel purpose to be streaming on there as well. All right, it looks like it's live on X. Let me check the volume and then we'll get started here. Also, if you guys like these kind of like earlier hangout, like pre-stream, you know, let me know and we can maybe do more of that. I can join like 30 minutes earlier. Okay. Looks like it's working. All right, guys, this is working on all the channels. Go ahead and formally announce this session. All right. Welcome to another Hoopo stream. Today we're going to be uh, looking at a paper called AI Champion Drone Racing. I guess that's not the actual name of the paper. The actual name of the paper is Champion Level Drone Racing Using Deep Reinforcement Learning. This is uh, in Nature, which is maybe the most famous journal, but this is work coming out of a group uh, from the University of Zurich and then also Intel Lab. So Intel, as in the company that makes your processors, but they have specific labs, uh, I guess, in Germany, and then also in, I don't know what WY is, Wyoming, Wisconsin. I don't actually know. I'm not, not cool enough to know which state that is. Um, but Intel is known for, uh, their, they have like a brand of cameras called the Intel RealSense. Uh, these are very popular in robotics. I've used these all throughout their lifetime back when they were shitty and now they're slightly less shitty, but uh, it seems like that's kind of the group here, right? So they have one of these Intel RealSense cameras in this uh, drone, so it makes sense that it's basically an academic group getting supported by the uh, people at Intel who work on these cameras. Uh, okay, so this paper is basically about quad rotor racing. So in this paper, the TLDR is they get a artificial intelligence or more specifically a deep reinforcement learning, which is a reinforcement learning that uses deep neural networks. And they get it to beat uh, these uh, fine gentlemen here who are basically human drone operators who, who fly these drones around with these headsets. It's a pretty badass kind of future thing, to be honest. They basically uh, wear these kind of like first person view goggles and then they fly these drones around at a ridiculously high speed and I don't know how the hell they don't vomit because it's certainly crazy but you got the DRL world Tra champion I think DRL stands for drone racing league you got three times Swiss champion so th these guys are kind of the best humans ever and this is kind of an idea here they have a little nice little video here but maybe not this one let's do this one here but you can see it's basically you have to kind of go through these little uh, gates and do it as fast as possible. And they have uh, some first-person view of that here. So here we can go to this video, but 
it's actually too fast. Here we go. But this is kind of what it looks like, and this is what it looks like first person view. So that the the human driver who's like looking at this, this is what they're seeing. So these these human pilots are pretty crazy. It's like real life Star Wars. So if you've never uh, really seen drones before, drones are sometimes also called quad rotors or quadcopters. And basically, let's see if we can get a little picture of a drone somewhere here. Yeah, it kind of looks like this. It has four propellers. And why four propellers? And the reason you have four propellers is because that gives you four uh, kind of degrees in which you can push and pull with the propeller, right? The propeller can create a push force. It could also spin the opposite way and create kind of like a pull force. So much like we're going to discover with quaternions, which describe any rotation with four numbers, quad rotors can effectively create any 60 position with four rotors. So I think there's something a little bit beautiful there where quaternions have four numbers, quad rotors have four uh, rotors. There are fancier uh, drones that don't have four rotors. I've seen like one rotor drone, uh, one motor drone. Yeah, I've seen drones that have one motor. I've seen this, these seem like little toy ones, but I've seen ones that look a little bit better. And also, I think the one in, uh, uh, I forget what it's called, but the drone in Mars. There is a drone in Mars. It's called the Ingenuity Helicopter. Yeah, this one here. But this one also does not have four. It has basically two. And that has to do with the fact that Mars doesn't really have uh, the same atmosphere that we have on Earth. So they have slightly different kind of requirements. And then possibly for simplicity reasons as well, they ended up with this design here. But most of the drones that you see in pretty much any robotics paper and the drones that are used for industrial inspection or kind of scanning or any kind of like surveying or anything like that they're almost always these four propeller quad drones as they're called uh, all right so let's go ahead and get started here uh hi Eugene. how's it going do you know how i knew you maybe you can't believe i knew you from the gpt4 recommender video okay okay Eugene. nice uh, we got an og here Christopher built one five years ago. The crazy thing is that the video you actually see used to be a lot worse. They show you mostly it was analog signals because of latency, but that was five years ago, so maybe it's better now. Yeah, I still don't know how they do that. Like, even just when you when I go in a VR headset and I do like a demo that has a lot of movement to it, it, it I get that kind of like sickness. So like, how these people can actually just like wear these headsets and just fucking zoom through these, like I don't know how they do that. Uh, but, you know, these guys all seem like Gen Z, and I think Gen Z just have, like, a, a superhuman ability to, like, stare at a screen and, and not get dizzy. Uh, and just FYI, just while we're rambling here and we haven't even started, all the links that I share here, so all the links that I have open, they're all available here on GitHub. You can go ahead to this Stream Docs repo that's on my GitHub, and you can find any of the links here. Uh, so that's that. Let's go ahead and get started, though, because this paper is a little bit long. First person view or FPV drone racing is a televised sport. I did not know it was televised, so that's interesting. In which professional competitors, are they actually professional? I don't know if they're professional. I don't know if these guys make a living from this. I think maybe they make some amount of money, but I don't think this is their full-time job. Uh, pilot high-speed aircraft through a 3D circuit. Each pilot sees the environment from the perspective of their drone by means of a video streamed from an onboard camera. And the onboard camera here is going to be one of these Intel RealSense cameras. Uh, reaching the level of professional pilots with autonomous drones is challenging because the robot needs to fly at its physical limits uh, while estimating its speed and location exclusively from onboard sensors. And this is kind of a, a big point here. And in this paper, everything is done from the onboard sensors. And that's not always the case. A lot of times when you go on YouTube uh, drone uh, acrobatics, this was uh, I'm not going to be able to find it, but basically for a long time, a lot of the stuff you saw with drones, maybe this one, but they wouldn't be using the onboard cameras. They would basically have uh, cameras all over the lab that would give you a perfect position for the drone, right? So it's not just that they're uh, being able to beat these champions with 
deep reinforcement learning, right? Because you could do deep reinforcement learning from a bunch of cameras that are kind of all around the circuit. But here they're doing it exclusively from the onboard sensors, which is kind of an order of magnitude more difficult. So that's kind of what makes this paper even more impressive. Uh, here we introduce SWIFT, uh, an autonomous system that can race physical vehicles to the level of human world champions. Okay, so that's what they're going to call it, SWIFT, pretty good little name there. System combines deep reinforcement learning. So deep reinforcement learning, again, is just reinforcement learning, which is a very old field of machine learning. Uh, that now is called deep reinforcement learning because you're basically adding, uh, you're you're adding neural networks as function approximators, and deep reinforcement learning is the technique behind AlphaGo, MuZero, like all of these uh, different uh, game AIs that you've seen out of DeepMind, for example, uh, in simulation with data collected in the physical world. So you have some kind of sim to real transfer happening here. A lot of these robotics systems, they're trained in simulation, and then you have um, this task of transferring the policy or the neural net that learns something in simulation and then actually applying it into the real world, and that, that is called sim to real. And that's actually a very difficult step to do, so we're going to see how they do it in this paper. Swift competed against three human champions. Uh, in real world head-to-head -head races, Swift won several races against each of the human champions and demonstrated the fastest recorded race time. So it's beating the humans. This work represents a milestone for mobile robotics and machine intelligence and inspires the deployment of hybrid learning-based solutions to other physical systems. Okay. Uh, all right, what do we got here? We got nature papers are a little bit weird. They have like their, their own kind of format. Some people like this format. Some people don't like this format. Um, I feel like it's a little dense. Uh, it's the frame rate. If it's too low, then it can cause motion sickness. Yeah. We're, we're still in that uncanny edge with the frame rate. I feel like, right, I've, I think I've talked about this before, but mo most humans can tell the difference between 60 FPS and 30 FPS, right? 30 frames per second, 60 frames per second. But then going from 60 frames per second to 120 frames per second, I feel like you need to be like, you need to kind of have a good eye in order to tell the difference. And then once you go to 120 frames per second to 240 frames per second, it's very difficult to tell unless you like have very good acute vision and you kind of know what you're looking for. But once we kind of get that past that boundary of like 120 frames per second, 240 frames per second, I think it'll kind of become like the, the screen on a cell phone where it doesn't actually matter to make it more pixel dense because most humans can't even tell the pixelation of one of the latest iPhones. So I think we're kind of in that uncanny phrase right now where the frame rate is still not there for these first person drones and for VR headsets, but I feel like we're just a couple years away from the frame rate getting just so good that it's uh, not noticeable by 99% of humans. Okay. So they start off with kind of a little background on reinforcement learning. Here are, are some of the biggest successes of reinforcement learning. You got Atari, Go, Chess, StarCraft, Gran Turismo, so on. And notice that all of these are environments that can be perfectly simulated, right? So it's no secret that reinforcement learning systems kind of uh, are very, like any other machine learning system, they need a ton of data, right? And it's very difficult to collect a ton of actual physical data. So the way that most reinforcement learning has worked has basically they, they constrain it to a simulated environment, right? And even Go and Chess, those are environments that you can simulate, right? And then you just have hundreds and hundreds of years of simulated experience, right? Which would be very difficult to do in the real world. So reinforcement learning is still kind of limited by this, uh, the amount of data it needs to work. And that's kind of why it always seems to be applied to simulated environments. Uh, limited to simulation, so here we go, simulation board game environments which support policy search in an exact replica of the testing conditions. Yeah. Overcoming this limitation and demonstrating champion level performance is a long-standing problem. FPV drone, drone racing is a televised sport. Vehicles used in FPV racing are quadcopters, uh, which are amongst the most agile machines ever built. Quite a statement. Uh, the vehicles exert forces that surpass their own weight by a factor of four or five or more. So they're kind of like little ants, I guess, that can push a lot harder than they weigh. They weigh pretty much almost nothing. Uh, each vehicle is remotely controlled, who wears a headset showing video stream, creating an immersive first-person view experience. So they have, I guess, here a little picture of that. I guess this is them actively racing here. 
I don't know why this guy's standing up, right? It feels like if you sat down, it might be better, but here we have kind of like a light trail so you can see the difference between the, the human pilot trajectory and the drone pilot trajectory. Uh, each vehicle, blah, 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 attempts to create autonomous systems that reach the performance state back to the first autonomous drone racing competition. Okay, so that was in 2016. So they might have been using deep reinforcement learning. That's definitely post deep learning revolution, which was kind of like 2013, 2012. That was the ImageNet and stuff like that. But I don't know, they, maybe not. Uh, accounting for uncertainty in perception. Alpha Pilot, this is 2019. Autonomous drone racing showcase some of the best research. The first two teams still almost still took almost twice as long as professional human pilots. Okay, so in 2019, you were still taking about just twice as long as a human pilot. And the interesting thing here is that this isn't even using any of the breakthroughs in language models, right? So a lot of the AI you see now is coming from the breakthrough of language models and even just language models applied to things like robotics, which is kind of a weird thing to think about, but it works, right? That's what we saw with the RT2 paper, with the Minecraft Voyager paper, but there doesn't really seem to be any any of the recent breakthroughs in this paper. This is just kind of improving on the stack that existed even as far back as 2019, right? Where you basically just have here a multi-layer perceptron neural net, right? 2 by 128, this refers to the number of layers. So we have two layers with 128 neurons. So this actually is four layers here, but they maybe are not counting the in input layer and then the output layer. But that's what the MLP 2 by 128 means. Uh, these here, 100 hertz, these refer to the control speeds. So obviously your camera, for example, your image is running at 30 hertz. Your gate detector, which is just some... Uh, vision algorithm that detects these squares uh, is running at 30 hertz, obviously because it requires the camera feed, right? So your image is at 30 hertz. That means your gate detector can at best be 30 hertz. Uh, here you have an IMU, which is an inertial measurement unit. This basically works, uh, tells you your orientation in space. This is the stuff that's inside your cell phone. So your cell phone has an IMU, right? Another term term for these are accelerometers, gyroscopes, things like that. Uh, usually they're a little bit more fancy than that, right? They'll have maybe multiple uh, different things that measure and then aggregate that together. And that runs at 200 Hertz. So much faster uh, measurement frequency there. Here you have uh, visual odometry, VIO and this runs at 100 hertz. And I think in this case here, they separate it out, but uh, these two are running within the camera. So the Intel RealSense camera itself, and here they have, I found a PDF spec sheet for the camera, which looks something like this, right? You have kind of two cameras like this, and then you have some space between them. And on this chip, you see how it says IMU center. It has an IMU on it. so. The visual odometry, which is basically just uh, movement in camera space, is coming from the Intel RealSense itself, which has basically all these chips built into it. So you can see how it has the left fisheye lens, the right fisheye lens. So it has a stereo camera rig, two cameras that are at a specific distance apart so that you can pretty much always uh, just do camera geometry and figure out how far away things are, right? You get this kind of stereo disparity, which allows you to give a, a rough idea of depth. Uh, but you also have this IMU here, so specifically BM1055. I don't really know much about IMU specs, but I, get, I bet you it's this 200 hertz IMU here. And you can see how uh, Intel, which also makes these Movidius chips, right? Intel makes their own kind of deep learning mini chips. If you guys have ever played with one of those little Intel Movidius USB, Intel Movidius USB. These are kind of a meme, but it's basically like a GPU that, that on a on a little, uh, they call it a neural compute stick, but you can literally stick it into a, uh, a USB drive. They're kind of terrible, to be honest. They're not even worth the money, but I guess here they stuck one of these inside the camera directly. And here you can see how it's giving a six DOF, which is six degree of freedom, which is basically your XYZ position and your... Uh, orientation and it's giving that to the system host which basically means that uh, whatever onboard computer is running uh, this other stuff here 
has access to that observation state here, right? Uh, and this stuff is feeding into this Kalman filter. So if you have any experience in robotics, you definitely know what a Kalman filter is, but if you do not, a Kalman filter is, sounds complicated, but it's actually very easy. And basically what a Kalman filter is doing is it's taking a bunch of noisy, st noisy observations, right? So you have a bunch of noisy observations such as your IMU, your visual odometry, your uh, gate detector, all of these things are telling you, here's where I think the drone is, right? Here's where I think the drone is right now. And you also have some, here is where I think the drone is at the previous time step, right? So there's this notion of, I have a bunch of sensors and they're each giving me observations and different sensors have different kind of variance and uncertainty, right? So maybe your IMU is a little bit more noisy than your uh, visual odometry or something like that. And you have a idea of how much more noisy one sensor is than another. And you have these kind of uh, models of the sensor noise and how those all kind of feed in together. And what a Kalman filter does is it basically aggregates that all together using some nice, very clean probability math where it's kind of building these uh, priors and then these posteriors and saying, okay, here's a distribution of where the thing probably is. And this sounds very fancy, but a long time ago, I found this uh, video. This is a kind of an older video, but it's basically a guy who built a balancing robot, just your standard little balancing robot, and he has a common filter running on it. And at one point, he zooms in on kind of what the common filter actually looks like. And I feel like this is the best visual intuition for what a common filter does. And this red line here is the uh, measurement coming from the IMU. And then the blue line is the output of the common filter. So you can see how the IMU is very noisy, right? It, it has an idea of what the orientation of the robot is, but there, there's noise in that. And you can see how the common filter is, a, is much more smooth and stable, right? So the whole point of a Kalman filter is to take these noisy observations from your sensors and smooth them out and create a single smooth, uh, more probable estimation of what the actual orientation is, right? So that blue line is the Kalman filter, and then this red line would be the input to the Kalman filter, which is your noisy sensors. I just really like this uh, visual intuition of what what exactly a common filter is doing. It's basically just stabilizing based on previous guesses and current guesses. Uh, okay, so all of these different sensors here at slightly different frequencies, each of them that have their own slightly different uh, uncertainties, right? And common filters even clever enough to say uncertainty can be in a specific dimension. So maybe one sensor has a lot more Z uncertainty versus XY uncertainty and so on. But this common filter running at 100 hertz gives you the final prediction of like, here is where I think the drone is, the 60 position of the drone in the world space, and it feeds that into this control policy. And your control policy is just a neural net. The word policy comes from the kind of mathematical terminology and baggage of reinforcement learning, but you can basically just think of it like the little neural net brain that's actually taking in the current state, which is your observations, and then outputting an action, right? And the action might be uh, push this rotor a little bit harder and this rotor a little bit softer and so on. And then that's it. You basically just feed that previous action and you just keep taking actions over and over and over and over and over again. And that's that control loop is running at 100 hertz, which seems pretty fast, but for something like this, it's probably probably just barely fast enough, to be honest. And this is something that we saw in... Uh, for example, the Tokamak reactor. So if you remember, we read a uh, nature paper where they looked at the plasma Tokamak reactor and using a reinforcement learning system to balance that. And one of the problems that they had is that you need to have an extremely fast control policy, control loop, in order to control the plasma in this giant toroidal spinning reactor. So a lot of times when you look at these reinforcement learning control policies, they seem really tiny, right? You you kind of ask yourself, why why is this such a tiny little multilayer perceptron, right? Why aren't they using a, a uh, 10 billion parameter transformer here for the control policy? Wouldn't that 10 billion parameter transformer just be so much uh, better at holding in all this information and, and having this kind of intricate, complicated control policy? 
Uh, probably yes, but then the problem is you wouldn't be able to run it at 100 hertz. So in these real world uh, reinforcement learning uh, robotics problems, you kind of need to have a very, very fast control policy. And, and then that kind of becomes the limiting factor for how big you can even make this neural net. So that's why these little tiny multi-layer perceptrons are still uh, kind of the state of the art for these control policies, just because they really need that uh, control loop to be as fast as possible. And actually, one thing that I'm curious about is what is the control speed of a human? Uh, reaction speed, I guess. Like, what is the human 0 0.25 seconds for a visual stimulus? That seems a little slow. Right, that's that means that humans are operating at four hertz. I feel like it may be a little bit faster than that. Yeah, 150 milliseconds. That seems more. So 150 milliseconds to hertz. Hertz to milliseconds. Does that that still seem slow? I don't know. I feel like humans probably can operate faster than that, especially these like drone racer dudes, like. I feel like 100 hertz is probably close to what they're doing with their hands, right? In terms of like how fast does it take for this guy to see something in that headset and then like adjust his little stick on this thing. It's probably around 100 hertz. I don't know. Uh, question, I don't know how to say your Chinese name. I'm sorry. Does that mean AI is controlling these motors separately? It is not controlling the motors separately. Uh, each the output of the control policy sometimes called the output space or the action space is here they have four numbers those four numbers probably represent the output for each of these four rotors so every single step it is outputting uh the what each motor force should be right and then you have some low level pid controller actually on the motor itself that is matching that exact desired output force I don't really know. I'm not much of a drone guy, to be honest. I'm, I'm more of a robotic manipulation guy. So uh, let's see if we find anything else in this first page before we keep going. Uh, policy is trained using on-policy model-free deep RL in simulation. So on-policy model-free deep RL in simulation. On-policy means that your data that you're training this is from that policy. So sometimes you see off-policy. And what that means is that the data that you're training your reinforcement learning system is not even made by that policy. So it could be, for example, what would off-policy uh, drone data look like in this case? In, in this case, off-policy drone data might be like uh, if the drone was flying around in the corner of this warehouse being controlled by a human. That would be off-policy. But here, all of it is on policy, which means it's, it's basically inside this track in the same kind of place where the actual policy would, would be doing it. Uh, model free, more <laughs> reinforcement learning terminology and reinforcement learning is kind of a quagmire of, of kind of this legacy terminology. So uh, bear with me as I explain this. So uh, reinforcement learning is sometimes split into model free and then model based. In model-based reinforcement learning, you are basically learning a model of the world and then using that model of the world uh, to train your policy. In model-free reinforcement learning, you're just learning the policy directly, right? And this becomes more of... Uh, uh, what am I trying to say here? It becomes more of kind of like a... a, a a holy war if you go kind of into like the idea of like what are we actually trying to do with reinforcement learning is building a world model required or not required but there are good examples of model free rl and model based rl so i don't know just kind of a little uh distinction there i guess uh, during training the policy maximizes a reward right so this is your model free you're training the policy directly from the reward uh, and that reward is some combination of rewards that are all hand designed by a human. So maybe there's a penalty for moving uh, too slowly. Maybe there's a some uh, reward that you get for going through each gate, some combination of gates, some it's probably a very complicated reward function. And in these real world RL, ses, 
RL systems, usually the reward function ends up being pretty complicated, and there's kind of a meme around that where uh, reward shaping and reward engineering is uh, a lot of what you do in reinforcement learning, and those are not seen as necessarily positive things, right? The fact that you have to come up with this kind of complicated reward function in order to get interesting real-world results. Uh, with a perception objective that rewards keeping the next gate in the field of view, so you can see here how already there's kind of a, uh, for example, a reward for keeping the next gate in the field of view, so more reward shaping. Seeing the next gate is rewarded. Uh, optimizing a policy purely in simulation yields poor performance on physical hardware if the discrepancies between simulation and reality are not mitigated. This is the sim to real gap, right? Where you train something in simulation, but then the real world is just not quite the same, right? It's like the, the physics are a little bit different, the control is a little bit different, so if you train a policy that is really only seen a very specific simulation, it's not going to work very well in the real world. There's a lot of different ways to, to kind of fix that or, or cross this sim to real gap. One uh, technique that was used, for example, in uh, OpenAI's uh, cube manipulation is domain re domain randomization. So in this paper, this is kind of old work at this point. This is work that OpenAI did back when they were actually OpenAI and they were more of a research lab. They even had like a robotics group, but they were basically manipulating this Rubik's cube with this dexterous uh, hand called a shadow hand, which I've actually worked with and actually low key is trash. I can tell you this, this shadow hand robot, it's very, very cool, but it's extremely expensive and it breaks extremely often. So it's actually kind of a shit robot. But uh, one of the ways that they managed to uh, traverse the sim to real gap is that they basically would change the physics inside the simulation. So they would make maybe the fingers a little bit longer, maybe the the contact friction different. It would change over the course of the simulation by and by having the simulation itself be uh, more of a collection of different simulations that have slightly different gravity, maybe slightly different friction, maybe slightly different weights on the cubes. The uh, policy, the reinforcement learning that, that learns to manipulate this cube, learns to be a little bit more robust to maybe the friction changing or the gravity changing. And then that means that when you actually uh, transfer it onto a real world hand like this one, it'll be it'll perform better, right? It's better capable of transferring or generalizing outside of simulation into the real world, right? Crossing that sim to real gap. So that's one way that you can do that. There's other ways, uh, but we're going to see which one they use in this paper. Uh, the difference between simulated and real dynamics. So this is kind of what I was describing. And then the noisy estimation of the robot's state by the observation policy when provided real sensor data. That's another thing, right? In simulation, you know exactly where that drone is. You have a perfect position, acceleration, and velocity for that drone. But in the real world, you don't have that. You have this noisy set of sensors which are each telling you slightly different things and you have to feed them all into this Kalman filter which is giving you something a little bit more stable but it doesn't have the kind of certainty and stability that uh, a simulated position and velocity would have. Uh, okay, we mitigate by collecting small amounts of data in the real world and then using this data to increase the realism of the simulator. Okay, so in this case, it seems like they're basically going to be tuning some of the hyperparameters of the simulator based on the real world data that they collect. Uh, we record onboard sensory observations together with highly accurate pose estimates from a motion capture system. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you know how I was uh, kind of lauding them for uh, using a motion capture system or not using a motion capture system? So it seems like they did use the motion capture system, but they only use the motion capture system for the purposes of uh, uh, doing this sim to real transfer. I also realized I skipped here. So I thought I was... Uh, <laughs> looking at this, but really I was looking at uh, this. So let's go back up here, back up to the first page. So what else we got? We got the physical track designed by professional drone racing pilot. Okay, so obviously the track could have a huge impact, right? I feel like you could definitely probably pick a track where the humans are going to win, and you could probably pick a track where the robot is going to win. So I don't know which one they did. Hopefully they picked one that kind of is a little bit of an even playing field. Uh, seven square gates arranged in volumes of 30 by 30 by 8 meters, so pretty big warehouse kind of space here, uh, forming a lap of 75 meters in length. Okay, so here you go, your champions. Given one week of practice on the racetrack, 
Damn, that's actually a lot. This is more impressive. I thought that they were just brought in. I thought they were just brought in the humans, and they're like, hey, you guys want to race this track? They give them maybe one or two practice laps, and then that's it. But one week of practice is significant. That's even more impressive. Okay. Uh, I want to master's in autonomous robotics. Any good robots I should buy? Hamza. So Hamza, maybe one thing I would recommend is uh, robotics is a is a... A very interdisciplinary field and uh it's actually people love robots right and because they love robots is often used as kind of an introductory topic for stem so uh for example here in the u.s we have this competition called first which is basically for high schools and uh basically high school kids get to design these robots that do these kind of little challenges uh, I would actually, if you're interested in robotics, I would recommend getting involved with something like this. Maybe not first, maybe you're not in the U.S., you don't have this kind of competition, but I bet you that there's probably in a high school or some kind of elementary school near you, there's a kind of a robotics competition. And these people are always looking for volunteers, right? And it's a really good way to to get some real-world robotic experience. You get to practice kind of just mentoring and, and teaching the kids. And then all the robotics people in that community also probably have network connections to robotics companies and things like that. So I would recommend, uh, yeah, there you go. Boom. I think those kind of like, uh, robot competitions for kids are some of the best places to get robotic experience for sure. Nice. Yeah. And then they're always looking for computer science people. Like a lot of times in robotics, you kind of have a bias towards hardware people. So having software people is always a positive. So if you're a software person, you're looking to get in robots, just highly recommend uh, robotics competitions like that. Even if you're not participating in it directly, even just kind of as a mentor and kind of just helping the kids, it's a great opportunity. Uh, okay. The race is set off by an acoustic signal. Okay, so there's maybe something there, right? You could see how the human has to wait for his ear to process it and then hit go versus the drone probably just immediately gets the signal and can go a little bit faster. Uh, our work marks the first to our knowledge, that an autonomous mobile robot achieved world champion level performance in real world competitive sport. Uh, is that true? I don't know if that's true. Would you consider, I guess now, nah, like the Go robot, right? The Go or StarCraft, like those are also real world competitive sports, but I guess the autonomous mobile robot part of this is what makes it unique. Uh, Christopher H answering questions nice I love it when you guys answer each other's questions so let's learn more about this Swift system Swift uses a combination of learning based and traditional algorithms that map onboard sensory readings to control commands this mapping consists of two parts an observation policy which distills high dimensional inertial information into task specific low dimensional encoding and then two, a control policy that transforms the encoding into commands for the drone. So you have two different policies here, which basically just means two different neural nets. Here we only really see the control policy, so I don't know where the observation policy is. They don't really show it here in this diagram. Here they just have the output of this perception system feeding into this control policy. But where is the observation policy? Okay, so here the observation policy distills all this uh, visual and inertial information into a task-specific low-dimensional encoding. So it's basically taking all of this, including the previous action, maybe action state, all of that, and then outputting some low-dimensional uh, representation, maybe a 128-dimensional vector that basically represents everything. Observation consists of a visual inertial estimator that operates together with a gate detector, which is a convolutional neural network that detects the racing gates in the onboard images. Detected gates are then used to estimate the global position and orientation of the drone along the racetrack. Okay, so this VIO and this gate detector are give, are both giving you kind of the same information, right? The gate detector is telling you there's a gate over here at this position, which means that I must be, I in terms of the drone, must be at this position. So the gate detector has some idea of where it is. And then this VIO is also giving you an estimate of where it is, right? So you have all of these different sensor systems are telling you their own guess as to where the drone is in 60 
state space, right? And then the Coleman filter, I guess, is the observation policy. <laughs> I don't know why they're calling the Coleman filter an observation policy, but the Coleman filter aggregates all of that and gives you a single observation state. This drone uh, camera resectioning in combination with a map of the track, the estimate of the global pose obtained from the gate detectors and combined from uh, with the estimate from the visual inertial estimator by means of a common filter, resulting in a more accurate representation of the robot's state. The control policy is represented by a two-layer perceptron. It maps the output of this common filter to control commands to the aircraft. All right, and then we go into the section that we kind of reviewed already. And here they're talking about... Uh, the motion capture system where you are using the motion capture system to get the actual 60 position of the robot and then in that way I guess let's see the robot is controlled by a policy training simulation that operates on the pose estimates provided by the motion capture system and then the recorded data allows to identify the characteristic failure modes of the perception dynamics through the racetrack okay so these are some uh, what they're describing here is sometimes called a system ID uh, step and in this step you basically you can run a set of behaviors or a set of motions in your simulator and your simulator will tell you okay when I did these things maybe accelerating and then stopping or moving here and then stopping this is the position of the drone and the velocity of the drone and the acceleration of that drone in the simulation and then I'm going to do the same thing in the real world except in the real world, I don't have the actual position and velocity and acceleration of the drone, so I'm gonna use this motion capture system, which is basically just a bunch of cameras all around the warehouse that are all looking at that drone, and because you have a lot of different cameras and you kinda of know where those cameras are, you can you know exactly, not exactly, but you know to a very high precision where the drone is in the real world. So you're using this ground truth, uh, real world position and real world velocity and real world acceleration, comparing it to the position acceleration acceleration and velocity of the simulation and then being able to say okay this is how uh, it's different right and they're calling this characteristic failure modes and so on and this uh, system ID as it's sometimes called is allowing you to then basically say okay if I train this thing in simulation then how do I need to change it so that it uh, now will work in the real world so it's all about addressing that sim to real gap the intricacies of failing perception and unmodeled dynamics. Unmodeled dynamics might be things such as turbulent wind or something like that. You know, like whenever the quad rotor spins those little propellers, it's creating these kind of like wind vortices, right? And those wind vortices are interacting with each other in a weird way. And maybe whenever you pass very closely next to one of these uh, gates, right, there's the wind pushes you in a weird way. And that's not at all accounted for in the simulator, right? The simulator is not a full FEA analysis of like fluid simulation of like the, the drone passing through wind as it goes through here. So these unmodeled dynamics, right? Dynamics that are not modeled by the simulation, they're there in the real world and they're not there in the simulation. And that's why there's a little bit of a difference between the simulation and the real world. Uh, the perception of the dynamics residuals are modeled using Gaussian processes and k-nearest neighbor regression, respectively. Okay, so these are the extra parts uh, where they have to basically adjust the simulated policy such that it works in the real policy. Uh, perception residuals to be stochastic and dynamic residuals to be largely deterministic. Okay, so perception residuals are stochastics. Residuals is just kind of the difference, right? So the residual is just the difference between two things. So, for example, uh, whenever we were looking at quantizing audio, uh, they always they constantly use this word residual, and they would quantize the residual, right? So they would say, here's my uh, actual signal, and then I have my uh, signal that I'm I don't know if predicting is the right word, but then the difference between those is residual. Here you have some residual in the perception, which is the difference between your sim perception and your real perception, and then you have the dynamic residual, which is the residual between your sim dynamics and your real dynamics. And they're saying that the perception residuals are stochastic, which means random, and then the dynamic residuals are more deterministic, which means you can predict them better. Your models are better for them. Uh, these residual models are integrated into the simulation and the racing policy is fine-tuned to this augmented simulation. Okay, so 
sounds like it's basically a two-step thing here. They're doing a pre-training and a fine-tuning, much like you would do pre-training, fine-tuning in a uh, language model, right? In this case, you're pre-training on your pure simulation, and then you're fine-tuning it into this augmented simulation, which has uh, extra terms that account for this extra weirdness, these extra unmodeled dynamics that are only there in the real world. Uh, this approach is related to empirical actuator models used for simulation to reality, more commonly called sim to real uh, transfer in reference, but further incorporate empirical model modeling in of the perception system and also accounts for the stochasticity in the estimate of the platform state. Okay. We ablate each component. Nice. So we're going to have a little ablation experiment to see how which of these things are more important than the others. We compare against recent work. Uh, including trajectory planning and model predictive control. Although such approaches achieve comparable or even superior performance to our approach in idealized conditions, such as their simplified dynamics and perfect knowledge of the robot state, their performance collapses when the assumptions are violated. So model predictive control is kind of more classic uh, type of control. So in this case, you have some model, right? And in the model for a drone would be a kind of basically like an actual mathematical model, right? You say, okay, I, I know what the mass of this drone is. I know what the forces that it's pushing are. I know what the, uh, for example, here, the torque at the different motors. Here's your Jacobian. So you can create a model of this, not in the sense of like, I have a neural net that's creating a model of something, but an actual, like I'm writing on a, on, on a piece of paper, I'm writing down dynamic equations, and then that's my system. And a lot of times with these common filters, you're, you have that stuff in there, right? You have a actual model of the system dynamics that is literally equations of motion, right? So that's kind of like the classic uh, way that the common filter generally is applied is you actually, you actually have an actual model of your physical system. And this works well for something like a pendulum or a, a wheel or something like that, right? But as soon as you get into these very complicated systems like drones that have all these kind of unmodeled dynamics, this type of model predictive control or more classic form of control starts to break down. Uh, we find approaches that rely on pre-computed paths are particularly sensitive to noisy perception and dynamics. So model predictive control, the way that ends up usually looking is basically you're kind of creating these almost like a spline, like a path ahead of you. And then the you're trying to kind of like fit on this spline or this path. And Let's see if I can spline control drone. Yeah, spline-based path planning for unmanned air vehicles, 2001. So this is kind of super old school. Uh, I'm really looking for a picture though. But yeah, something like this. Something like this might be the output, right? Where you have basically this set of positions that you're, you're saying, okay, this is exactly where I want the drone to be, and I'm going to basically move my rotors, and I have some estimate of all the dynamics of the system, which is some equation of motion, right? And then that's in my, according to my model, it's going to produce this particular trajectory, but basically the answer is it never does, right? It never actually produces that trajectory uh, because there is so much weirdness in the real world. Uh, no traditional method has achieved competitive lap times, so Swift is the real Jews. All right. I guess in Nature Papers, you put the results right in the front here. So you go straight into the results. Uh, the drone takes place on a track designed by external world-class FPV pilot. Uh, so you have some weird things such as a split S. I don't know what that is, but if some of you are into drone racing, you might know what that is. Pilots are allowed to continue racing even after a crash, blah, blah, blah. Swift wins five out of nine races, four out of seven, and then six out of nine against uh, the three different champions here. Out of the 10 losses, 40% were because of a collision, 40% with a collision. So it's basically colliding with the opponent. That's kind of interesting. I wonder if you could uh, train it in a simulation where it actually collides with other competing drones, right? Like kind of like a bumper cars type of thing. Adversarial drone racing, that'd be kind of cool. Uh, wins most races, also achieves the fastest race time recorded. Pretty badass. 
Uh, figure 4, extended table 1D, provide an analysis of the fastest lap flown by Swift and each human pilot. Okay, so figure 4 is this one here. Single lap time comparison. So these are, this is the Swift, which is the AI, and then you have the three uh, different drone champions here, Shaper, Vanover, and Bitmata. And right off the bat, right, one thing you notice is that there's a little bit more variance for the humans. So the humans sometimes have slow laps and sometimes have very fast laps, but the AI is very, very consistent. You see how it's pretty much almost exactly the same time. Um, got the median. This is like an overly confusing thing here, right? It's like a combination of one of these kind of like box plots where you have the four quadrants, right? So this line, this line, and then the two boxes which represent 50% of the data and then this line here. But I feel like they should have just not had all this extra crap here. That just makes it more confusing. But this is how many times they had it run. So 483 times it did this circuit. That's Damn, dude. Bitmata did 469 laps. That's, that's a lot of laps. <laughs> Poor humans. Uh, but here you have three laps compared to single laps. Kind of a similar story here where the humans have a little bit more variance and are a little bit slower than the, drone, than the AI. So you see the AI is on average faster. It even has the fastest time as well. All right. Uh, Swift has a lower reaction time, taking off the podium on average 120 milliseconds before the human pilot. So this is something that we kind of guessed. So I guess we're correct on that. The, the AI kind of has a faster start, but uh, it has a half a second lead over the best time. So even though it has the fastest lap, it's not because it has the fastest start, right? So it has a half a second over the best time, but then it only starts 120 milliseconds before the human pilot. So it's 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 not just due to the fact that it can basically start a little bit faster. Swift finds tighter maneuvers. One hypothesis is that Swift optimizes trajectories on a longer time scale than human pilots. It is known for model free RL can optimize long term rewards through a value function. Uh, conversely, human pilots plan their motion on a shorter time scale, up to one gate into the future. Interesting. Okay, so the the AI is doing a more complicated optimization, right? So rather than just maybe trying to get through this gate, it's actually looking a couple gates ahead and has, in that way, maybe it takes a slightly tighter turn or something like that, right? So that's one thing that they kind of note pointed out here. Uh, let me see if I can slide here, but... This is just the ground truth estimate. This video is actually quite good, by the way, but yeah, right here. So the AI takes tighter turns. So you can see here the AI is capable of taking this very tight bank between these two gates versus the human takes a longer turn. And I think part of this might be the fact that the human is almost... The human doesn't have the same set of sensors that the drone has, right? The drone has all this extra kind of positional information, right? It knows exactly where it is as a six-dimensional uh, state. So I bet you that it's probably capable of, of moving in a way that the human couldn't because the human kind of has to see the gate, right? The human has to basically do everything from vision. So the human is just kind of stuck to overfitting to a specific input modality, a specific part of the observation, which is the images versus the drone or the AI can use probably more of the actual 60 position to make these kind of tight turns, right? So that's kind of one way that that, that the AI is possibly beating the, uh, the human pilot. So even just look at here, look at the, the way that this AI uh, does this kind of like vertical gate here. It kind of like does this very short loop versus the, the human does a very longer kind of loop like that. Interesting. Uh, human fatigue more easily than the circuit, then they take that into compensate? I think so, you know, although I bet you these, these guys are probably cracked out, right? Like I feel like, <laughs> I don't know much about uh, champion drone racing, but I bet you it's a lot like video games where these guys are just on a ton of Adderall and like 
pretty much every other like stimulant you could think of. So I don't know if these guys ever get tired. <laughs> I bet you they're uh, they're pounding those Adderalls. Uh, okay. Uh, the human pilots are faster in the beginning, but slower overall. Human pilots orient this aircraft to face the next gate earlier, right? So that the humans kind of have to fly it slightly differently because they need to be able to see the gates. Human pilots are accustomed to keeping the upcoming gate in view versus Swift has learned to execute some maneuvers while relying on other cues, such as inertial data and visual odometry. Yeah, so I don't know, maybe I should just read the paper rather than speculating because I just end up reading the exact spiel that I went down. The autonomous drone achieves the highest average speed, finds the shortest racing line, and manages to maintain the aircraft closer to its actuation limits throughout the race. Uh, compare the performance of Swift and the human champions. Single pilot races the track. Accumulate the time trail data. Use more than 300 laps. And then this is kind of what we saw here. Human pilots decide whether to push for speed on a lap-by-lap -lap basis. The availability to adapt the flight strategy allows human pilots to maintain a slower pace if they identify that they have a clear lead so as to reduce the risk of crash. Interesting. So the humans are kind of trading off crashing versus flying or speed. So that's kind of interesting where I assume that they're probably used to racing in an environment where there's a bunch of other people racing with them. So it's kind of like, uh, have you guys ever seen the uh, Olympic speed skating crash yeah so there was this crazy olympic speed skating where basically like the guy who was last won because there was uh this kind of big crash and they all kind of crashed and then the the guy who didn't crash won so you see here they like all crash Boom, that guy falls down, this guy falls down, it knocks over that other guy, and then the guy who ends up winning is the guy who didn't crash. So there's probably a similar kind of thing going on with these drone racing where they basically, they they play this game of just kind of like just being just about as fast as the person in front of them but not crashing. But the AI doesn't play that kind of game. The AI just tries to be as fast as possible on every single lap at every time. Uh, all right, and then the discussion section. FPV drone racing requires real-time decision-making based on noisy and incomplete sensory input from the physical environment. Uh, we have presented an autonomous physical system that achieves champion-level performance uh, and exceeding the human champions. It is akin to the human vestibular system. Yeah, and humans have... So the human vestibular system that they're referring to here is the fact that you can close your eyes and if you tilt your head you know that your head is tilted, right? So you have a little inertial measurement unit inside your head. It's called the inner ear. And the inner ear has like this little fluid and then it kind of know, you know what orientation you're in roughly. It's not a very good IMU, but the humans do have an IMU. But uh, that is not the case here for these drone pilots. These guys don't have an IMU, right? They only have vision. So it's not quite uh, the same, right? The drone has the IMU, but the human pilots don't have the IMU. Uh, lower sensory motor latency. Okay, so here we have actually the latency of a human pilot, which is we were looking for that before. So 220 milliseconds for expert human pilots versus 40 milliseconds for Swift. Uh, the limited refresh rate of the camera. So obviously cameras are kind of way slower, right? So a camera is running at 30 frames per second, 30 hertz versus your IMU way faster than that, 200 hertz. Uh, human pilots are impressively robust. They can crash at full speed, and if the hardware still functions, carry on flying and complete the track. Swift was not trained to recover after a crash, so it doesn't care. Human pilots are able to robustly change, robust to changes such as illumination, which can markedly alter the appearance of the track. Ooh, that's interesting. So if you take a flashlight and you flash it, or you change the lighting, that becomes a difference now, right? The the policy, the control policy, has only been trained in a simulation that has the same exact lighting. So by adjusting the lighting, you can fuck it up. So now you guys know. If you guys ever want to be, uh, uh, if you guys are ever in a situation in a dystopian future where you have to beat an AI pilot and you're sitting there in the cockpit, you should uh, take out your cell phone and then just flash it 
at the uh, AI pilot and the AI pilot won't be able to adjust to the uh, change in illumination and therefore you will be able to beat it. But I don't know, I'm, I'm sure that in the future AI pilots will be uh, trained with illumination as a uh, domain randomized uh, dimension, which means that they will be able to adjust their policy to the illumination difference. So I don't know, maybe that advice I gave you is no good. Uh, if this assumption fails, the system can fail. Robustness to appearance can be provided by training the gate detector in the residual observation and diverse set of conditions. So here they're talking about uh, uh, domain randomization in the visual modality. So actually the OpenAI cube, the example I showed you, this is what visually changing the uh, appearance, right? So you see here they, they use different colors, different textures, different lights. So different angles for the light, different intensities, different colors for the light. This is visual domain randomization, but you can also apply domain randomization to the physics and the, for example, the lengths of the joints and so on. But here they're referring to the visual version of that. Uh, addressing these limitations could enable applying the presented approach in autonomous drone racing competitions, which access to the environment and the drone is limited. Okay. Our work may inspire the deployment of hybrid learning-based solutions in other physical systems, such as autonomous ground vehicles, aircraft, and personal robots. Okay, what do we have here? We have figure four, a comparison of the fastest race of each pilot illustrated by the time behind Swift. Okay, so I guess here you have three laps, you have different segments of the race, and then you can see the three humans versus the drone time behind the drone so obviously they all start at zero but then you can see how the the drone kind of pulls away from them so obviously this guy here shaper seems to be the worst pilot he got a four seconds behind the best drone time versus this guy here vanover seems to be the best pilot and he got kind of half a second underneath the drone and you can see here, there seems to be a common place where the drone kind of beats out, right? So segment three right here, this gate right here, all three of the human pilots fall a little bit behind the drone. And again here, segment three. So this this part here, this segment three, seems to be where the uh, drone kind of runs away with the money. And they're looking at here the segment three, right? So it's right when this uh, drone moves and I guess which one is the is red the drone visualization of where the human pilots are faster red and slower blue so here I think this is kind of interesting because they're showing you the camera position right so let's zoom in so you can see here this little triangle coming out of the drone that's that's showing you the camera right so this is the orientation of the camera and you can actually kind of see here how the human, it seems like the human kind of points the camera at the gate so that when the human is going from this gate three or gate two to gate three, it, it, it's turning the camera to look at the gate because the human needs to see the gate, right? The human has a very slow reaction speed. So it's, it's kind of like it has to wait to see it, but the drone or the AI doesn't give a shit, right? The AI knows exactly where it is. The AI knows the exact position of this gate and that gate, and it knows its position. So it, it doesn't need to point the camera at the gate, so it can kind of get away with a kind of a weirder turn where it just kind of like very quickly turns. So that kind of reliance on the visual modality is maybe the kryptonite for the human racers, right? I wonder if you uh, limited the drone uh, to only vision, whether it would succeed. Probably not, right? I bet you that uh, if they got rid of this stuff here, if they got rid of the... Uh, IMU and this uh, visual odometry if all they were using or actually if all they were using was just this gate detector and the visual odometry at a 100 hertz at a 30 hertz control rate no way this drone would be able to beat the humans right so the reason the drone is winning is because it has this IMU VIT would be way too slow yeah you are correct Christopher but it would be way too slow now right I think that 10 years from now, for sure it's going to be a VIT, right? For sure, Or probably even whatever is beyond the VIT. There's probably some other vision architecture that's even better than a VIT that we haven't discovered yet. But that's why they're using this little multi-layer perceptron, just because it needs to be extremely fast, and it also needs to uh, perform inference on the drone computer, which is probably very small. 
uh, insects can be giant bee giving us that insect fact. Thank you, giant bee, for these facts. <laughs> uh, apparently, insects can be around 30 to 50 millisecond reaction speed. That's quite interesting. I wonder if there's a relationship there, right? I wonder if insects have a very fast reaction speed because they have a very little brain. You know, like humans have a very big visual cortex, right? The visual cortex is right here. It's in the back of our head. So human visual cortex, right? Uh, it's back here. And our visual cortex is hierarchical, right? There's these hierarchies of, of, of neurons, right? So they actually look kind of like a convnet. But basically, you have these hierarchies of neurons, and it has to go through that entire hierarchy before it can go to your prefrontal cortex, which is actually where you're thinking. So the drone pilot, right, they're thinking about stuff here in the in the prefrontal cortex, but then they're seeing the stuff, the, the actual visual information is in the back of their head. So the, the stuff needs to go all the way to the back of their head from their eyes, and then it needs to go through all the way to the front of their head, right? So just literally the size of the brain and the fact that we have these hierarchical layers that it needs to go through means that maybe our, our control speed as a human is limited by the fact that our brain is actually pretty big versus something like an insect has a very tiny brain, right? It only needs to go through like maybe a couple layers of, of neurons and you're already there. So maybe that's kind of the advantage there is that smaller animals with smaller brains like uh, insect have just kind of like an inherently faster control policy. Have you seen any drone applications in factories? Yeah, there is drone stuff in factories. I've seen uh, drones that, so in a lot of factories, drones in factories, you have these like big uh, pallet uh, kind of storage areas. Let me see if I can find any, like kind of like this. So you have these like big warehouse uh, sections with pallets, right? And I've seen drones that go around and basically just very slowly fly around these and just take pictures of, of things. This is some kind of fake simulated environment. Obviously you can see here that every single box looks exactly the same. I've never seen this. I've never seen drones flying with packages inside a warehouse, but I have seen drones that are just basically going back and forth in these kind of like uh, rows of pallets like this and they just like kind of take a picture of a QR code move to the next thing take a picture of the QR code move to the next thing something like that but drones like they're very good but they're just the biggest problem with drones right now is the safety is that as soon as you have drones you have to have all this extra crap around safety because like what if it falls down right it could hurt someone and safety is such a huge thing in these warehouses that it's just a pain to have drones so regulation is right now the biggest problem with drones is that in order to use drones, you have to have all this extra guarantees around like if it fell, is it going to be okay? And that's kind of a huge pain. But as soon as we get rid of that, whether it's by passing better regulation or whether it's by having all this extra safety stuff that basically makes that regulation no longer applicable, I think you're going to see drones everywhere because I feel like drones are actually very good for all these other problems like last mile delivery and package delivery. They're, they're so good. You know, they're so, they're just, they're just the perfect robot. You know, it's just that they're very noisy. That's one thing, but the safety is also the other part. Uh, we've also got muscle reaction speed delays. Yeah. Uh, what about Sam model? So Sam, uh, Eugene, you're talking about the segment anything model. So that's a segmentation model. That's uh, kind of a more, a much more specialized type of computer vision model. This is a reinforcement learning system. There is a computer vision model here. So right here, this gate detector, right? This thing here that is going from this image here, which is a fisheye image into this gates, right? This is some form of a post detection model. So this is kind of more similar to something like a segment anything model, but it's a different problem, right? This is pose detection versus segmentation, which is uh, basically segmenting the, the image into different classes. But I don't think they're doing any kind of uh, segmentation here. And especially not the segment anything model, because the segment anything model is actually quite big. It's a big kind of foundational model, certainly not uh, possible to run it at a 30 hertz control speed, control loop. Okay. Keep these questions going, guys. I like these questions. Uh, all right. 
So we were looking at this, we're looking at how the AI pilot doesn't have to really use the camera as much so it can kind of cheat on some of these and like be looking at a weird direction. Uh, now let's kind of go into the appendices. So one thing I noticed here is that in this, uh, so this is a nature paper and it seems like the format of this nature paper, right, is, is more condensed. I kind of almost like this. So they start with the kind of, they have the abstract, which every paper has, then they have the introduction, then they have, they go, they skip the related work section, they basically go straight into the method section, which is this section here where they just describe the whole system, then they go to the results section, and all of these are a little bit smaller, then they go into kind of the discussion and conclusion section, and then they end it. So it's a very short paper, but the reason it's short, it's because they basically put everything here, so they have a very large kind of appendix section, so I kind of like that. I kind of like this format where it's basically that you have like kind of a condensed form of the paper and then if you really want more of the details you can just scroll down here and you have the actual uh, more information if you really need it. So let's look at some of this. So here we have the dynamics of the vehicle, right? And remember how I said that uh, if you were using more traditional control methods, right, you wouldn't be using a neural network. You would be basically writing down the equations, much like you can write down the equations for a pendulum, right, the physics equations for a pendulum. You can write down the physics equations for a quad rotor, right? You can say, okay, well, I have these, uh, these axes, and then there's a force that pulls up on this thing, and I know the exact distance between that quad rotor and the center of mass of the drone. I know what that force is. I can thus uh, calculate the torques at each of the or at for each of the kind of axes, and I can write this system of equations. And then this is telling me uh, how the system should change. So if I know what the position and the velocity and the acceleration are, and I know what the forces that I'm going to apply are, then I should be able to tell you where the drone is in the next time step and two time steps from now and three time steps from now. But the secret is that these aren't actually the dynamics of the vehicle, right? There's extra stuff in here that these equations don't account for, right? There's all that weird interaction that I was talking about with the actual like fluid dynamics of the air, right? There's the fact that uh, maybe when you're spinning the rotors, there's a little bit of vibration and that vibration introduces some amount of deformation which changes some of the uh, the the dimensions of the drone, right? There's so many other little tiny things in the real world like that that change the dynamics and these dynamic equations, and therefore that's why these uh, this model of the of the system is not perfect, and that's why any control policy based on this model is not going to be perfect either. Uh, so let's actually go a little bit. Let's see what these different terms are here. Uh, this section briefly explains the simulation. Okay, so this dot represents quaternion rotation. Where's that dot? So here you're taking this uh, force here. Oh my God, I'm not gonna be able to highlight, but here you have the force of the propeller, the force arrow, here we go aerodynamic force, and then you have force of the propeller, so the lift force of the actual uh, rotor, and that's being rotated by this quaternion here, quaternion WB denotes the position, uh, attitude, and inertial velocity of the quadcopter. So QWB is the orientation or quaternion representing the orientation of the uh, quad rotor. P is the actual position. So this is going to be a, P is going to be a three-dimensional number, a three-dimensional vector. Q is going to be four-dimensional vector. V is the velocity, which is going to be uh, a three-dimensional vector. And then uh, omega B is going to be the angular velocity, which is going to be a either three-dimensional or four-dimensional. But anyways, while I was preparing for this stream, I found a visualization for quaternions. So I promised you guys before, but quaternions are a way of representing a rotation, right? So you have uh, Euler angles. And I know that some of you guys might be uh, cringing at the fact that I say Euler angles instead of Euler angles, but Euler angles just sound stupid, right? I don't know. Like, it's it's Euler. It's E-U-L-E-R. I know that every single math professor you've ever had loves that uh, kind of one weird fact where, like, they tell you, oh, it's Euler angles, right? And then they, they kind of try to to entice you by giving you that one weird fact that this word is not pronounced how it's read, but I think that's a bunch of nonsense. It's just a, a useless factoid 
to have in your brain that's just taking up space that could be better utilized by a better factoid. So I'm all for throwing away these useless factoids. This word looks like Euler, therefore I want to pronounce it Euler. But Euler angles are basically representing a rotation with three numbers. You have uh, the number that represents uh, the roll, the pitch, and the yaw, right? And with these three numbers, I can tell you the rotation of an object. But the secret is that you can't, right? Is that there's something called gimbal lock, which means that there's certain combinations of these numbers where it's hard to know what the actual position of that thing is, right? So the three numbers, roll, pitch, and yaw, are not enough. Those three Euler angles are not enough to have a perfect idea of what the orientation of this object is. So next thing you could do is you could look at a rotation matrix. A rotation matrix has nine numbers, right? A, a two-dimensional rotation matrix has four numbers. A three-dimensional rotation matrix has nine numbers. And a rotation matrix will tell you exactly the rotation of an object in 3D space, right? But it's nine numbers, right? So now we know exactly what the position is and the orientation every single time, but we're, we have to use nine numbers, which is a lot of numbers. So three numbers is not enough and nine numbers is too many. And that's where quaternions come in. And quaternions are four numbers that perfectly describe every single rotation in space. And I found this uh, quaternion visualizer, which is written by the Grant Sanderson guy. This is the guy who has that three blue, one brown uh, YouTube video, which is a, a great uh, YouTube channel. I would heavily recommend it. But he has this little website where you can change quaternions. And you can see here, this is some uh, sphere, right? And they have some points here just to make it more obvious to you that the sphere is rotating. But you can go like this and you can rotate uh, the sphere. So you can change here the number. So you can see how if I rotate the sphere like this, I change that. So you can see how each of the quaternion numbers change the rotation. And, you, and every single rotation of this sphere can be represented with a quaternion, which is one of these four numbers, right? And actually, even cooler than that, I found this, which is a way to think about what exactly a quaternion is. And this is kind of the cooler thing, is that uh, you know what a complex number is, right? So a complex number is a real number, such as here, 1, plus some other uh, number here, which represents the complex part of it. And you know how a rotation, you can also think of complex numbers as kind of like a rotation, right? So this number here, 0.85 plus 0.53i, you're using those two numbers to represent a rotation like this, right? So quaternions are basically the same thing, but now you're doing it in 4D. So it's like the complex number plane in 4D to represent rotations. See here, these four numbers, change these numbers, you can see how the rotation, it doesn't, it doesn't correspond exactly to the Euler angle. So it's not like if I grab one of these, it's gonna rotate around the x-axis and the other one's the y-axis and the other one's the z-axis. It's like they're not, there's, there's a little bit more of a weird dependence on, on them there, but it's four numbers that represent the rotation. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's what a quaternion is. Okay, uh, the motor time constant is k mot, and the motor speeds omega and omega ss are the actual and steady state motor speeds. Okay, so here you see how the motor speed divided the difference in the actual and the steady state motor speed divided by the motor speed constant somehow gives you this, which is the uh, velocity or acceleration, I guess. Because if this is speed, then the, the dot here represents uh, the derivative of that. So if you have x, that's position, x dot is velocity, uh, v is velocity, v dot is acceleration. So that's what these little dots mean. Uh, not this dot. This dot means uh, multiply, but the little dot like that basically means the the derivative of that with respect to time. Uh, okay, what else we got here? We got the torques at each of the different parts here. We got the torque for the motor. We got the torque for the aerodynamic force. We got the torque. What is T inner? Torque is modeled as a sum of four components. The torque generated by the individual propeller thrusts, T prop. You have the yaw torque generated by a change in motor speed. Okay, so aerodynamic torque. So if you guys have ever seen these uh, Kubli, yeah, so this is kind of a cool little robot, but this robot, 
basically has these uh, flywheels, I want to say, but it can do kind of cool things like this. It can kind of like jump up. Let me see if I can find a picture of it jumping. Here's a picture of it rotating. But it's doing all of this because it can control its own internal angular momentum and torque, basically, right? Kind of a cool little thing. This is how uh, satellites work too, by the way. Satellites have these kind of things as well so that they can control their orientation in space because there's nothing to push off, push against, right? There's nothing to push against in space, so you gotta have to push off against yourself. And you can see how basically what it does is it like spins up one of these things and then it stops it very quickly. And that stop allows it to control it. So there is basically the equivalent of those kind of forces inside a quadcopter. You're not trying to do that with a quadcopter, but you, you kind of have to account for that, right? So that's this uh, yaw torque generated by a change in motor speed. Uh, various aerodynamic effects such as blade flapping and an inertial term. So you have this extra term here. And in these kind of dynamic, uh, dynamic model of the vehicle, right, there's all these extra real world things such as the what they're calling blade flapping. I, some, I, I mentioned the uh, fluid dynamics of the air, the wind, other weird things like that. What they'll try to do is they'll try to pack those into some of these, right? So they'll try to say that, hey, this uh, T arrow, uh, there's going to be a bunch of other aerodynamic effects. We're just going to pack it all into this term here, and then we're just going to assume that our estimate of it is pretty good. But there's a bunch, this T arrow really has a bunch of other terms inside of it that we just don't know what they are. Uh, okay. Individual components are given as such. You sum up all the forces and the torques. Here, this is uh, how you calculate the torque from a force. So if you've ever taken like a statics class, right? If you have a force and you're pushing down like this, right? You take the force and then you have the, the moment arm as it's called. And that R, this distance times that force will give you the torque. So the amount of torque that I'm applying at this point here is basically the force times this moment arm, right? So that's what's going on here is the moment arm R times that force gives you a torque. You can then add that to all the other torques and get the total torque on the whole thing. Uh, here you have the Jacobian, right? The Jacobian is the first order uh, derivative. Hessian is the second order. So Jacobian is the first order. You're using that to basically uh, change this omega, which they told us here, the uh, bot, call it body rate. What the fuck is that? It's basically angular velocity of the drone. What else? Uh, JMP is the derivative of the ith motor speed, right? So the Jacobian. Uh, what else? Assumes that the lift force and drag force are proportional to the square of the propeller lift. So again, another kind of uh, simplification here, right? You're assuming that the speed of the actual propeller and the basically gives you the force, but that's not necessarily true, right? There's other variables here, right? Depending on your orientation, depending on kind of the vibration of the of the of the actual propeller. There's so many other things that are going to change it. But in this kind of simple dynamic model, you're kind of just pretending that that's not the case and that the force and the torque for every single rotor can just be simply calculated from the speed of the uh, propeller itself. Uh, what else? Aerodynamic forces and torques are difficult to model with a first principles approach. We thus use a data-driven model. Okay. I like that. To maintain a low computational complexity required for large scale, a gray box polynomial model is used rather than a neural network. Uh, okay, so this is probably why they keep calling this a hybrid approach. Because it's a hybrid of traditional methods and then modern methods, which is neural nets. So if they would have used a neural net, maybe you could have called this a model-based RL. If you would have had a neural net that kind of predicts all these uh, dynamics, it predicts the world basically. Assumed to be primarily dependent on the velocity B and the average squared motor speed, the aerodynamic forces and torques are estimated in the body frame. 
So here they refer to the uh, the frame of reference of the actual uh, quad rotor, not the world frame. So the world frame would be the actual environment, right? The warehouse frame. There's no velocity in the world frame. There's no acceleration in the world frame. It's just a static world frame. There could be though, right? You could imagine this being a warehouse that's uh, floating in space or something like that. Uh, quantities denote the three actual axial velocity components, denotes the speed in the place of a quad rotor. On the basis of insights from the underlying physical processes, linear and quadratic combinations of the individual terms are selected. For readability, the coefficients multiply each summoned have been omitted. Okay, so here they basically took this here and turned it into the net force in the x, net force in the y, net force in the z, torque x, torque y, torque z. And you can see how these are basically uh, combinations of some of the stuff here. The respective coefficients that are identified from real-world flight data. This is where they're using their motion-captured flight trajectories of the drone. So they have the drone perform some actions in the real world. They motion capture it so that they know exactly what these VX, VYs uh, are. Right, because they have that motion capture system, and that allows them to find these uh, coefficients, which they've omitted here. So there's coefficients in front of these terms here. And then those coefficients allow them to say, okay, well, in simulation, this is what those coefficients are. In real world, this is what those coefficients are. And now we can adjust the simulation so that, or the policy trained in simulation so that it works in the real world. Allowing the dynamic model to fit the track. This is akin to the human pilots training for days or weeks before the race that they will be racing. Kind of maybe, I don't know, I feel like the humans are doing something else. Beta flight low level controller. To control the quad, quad rotor, the neural network outputs a collective thrust and body rate. This control signal is known to combine high agility with good robustness to simulation to real transfer. The predictive collective thrust and body rates are then processed by an onboard low level controller so the neural network is running on this, right? Or is the neural network not running on this? Like where is the neural network running? Is it running on a computer that's like sending commands or is it like running on the actual onboard computer? That's something that they kind of seem to be avoiding telling us here. Uh, subsequently translated into analog voltage signals through electronic speed controller that controls the motor. So this is the actual voltage signal is what actually controls the motor. So you have kind of a lower level controller there. This PID controller, proportional integral derivative controller. There's a plot for this that I feel like always PID controller makes it much more obvious. What am I looking at? What am I looking for? Yeah, here. So you have some reference signal. This is what you want, right? So maybe your neural net is saying, I want zero thrust, and then now I want one thrust, right? And then the the PID controller is going to be the actual thrust, right? The PID controller is going to try to get the actual uh, motor to create the desired thrust. So you can see here how the three uh, terms in the PID controller, the PID controller has three different terms. It has this proportional gain, integral gain, and derivative gain. And you can see in this how each of them affects. So the integral gain, the proportional gain, and the derivative gain. So you can see how all three of them together result in this kind of ability to match the desired reference signal. You need all three of those. Uh, implemented using the open source Betaflight and BL Heli32 firmware. Okay, so I guess this is probably the stuff that runs on these quad rotors. Uh, in simulation, we use an accurate model of both the low-level controller and the motor speed controller. Okay, so in simulation, it's not even that they perfectly output the velocity or the force at each of the rotors. They actually have a simulated PID controller. So this is this is nice. You know, it means the simulation is accounting for the fact that there's some messaging overhead between the actual control policy and then the PID and then the way that that's actually implemented in the actual motor itself. 
So that's another tricky thing to always get right. So simulating that directly is a pretty good idea there. Flight controllers. Giant B dropping some more knowledge here. As previously mentioned, drone doesn't recover from crash. Controllers without neural net suffer from this general. Yeah, so the crash would be off policy, right? This controller can only work on policy. So as soon as you go too far away from where this drone or where this was trained, right? And in terms of like close to that trajectory, close to the areas of the state space that is explored, the uh, reinforcement learning control policy will no longer work well, right? So crashes are definitely not in the uh, training data. Trying to match an expected, assuming deviation. When the dynamics go off the rails, it doesn't recover. Atlas robot. Yeah. So good insights, Giant B. Uh, because the Betaflight PID has been optimized for human, it exhibits as some peculiarities, which in the simulation correctly captures. The reference for the D term is constantly zero, pure damping. Okay, so KD is always zero. So this term here, KD, zero. Is there a better percent overshoot? So this part, this KD, this derivative gain is zero, which means that this whole shit here is always zero, which means it's really just a PI controller. The I term gets reset when the throttle is cut and under motor thrust act saturation, the body rate control is assigned prior priority Proportional downscaling. The gains of the controller used for simulation have been identified from the detailed logs of the beta freight controller's internal states. Damn, so they actually recreated this beta flight PID controller in simulation piece by piece. And the and the beta flight PID controller actually isn't even a PID controller, it's like a weird variant of it that has a zero D term and some weird properties here. Okay. Low-level controller converts the individual motor commands into a pulse width modulation signal and sends it to the ESC. What is the ESC? The on electronic speed controller. So PWM is how you control. I found this nice little visualization here, but uh, pulse width modulation, which is how you control a lot of servos, a lot of motors, and even things like light bulbs. So in this uh, here, they're basically changing the intensity of a light of an LED in this video. So here. He's changing the intensity of an LED, but basically what PWM, how PWM works, and I think this is like the cleanest visualization of it, is that, maybe not this, this. Here, let me see. Yep. You can basically change the voltage by changing the, 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 you see how the average output here, more voltage, less voltage. So you have fine grain control over the voltage by just changing the distance between these pulses and how long these pulses are. So think of it like if I have a light bulb, right, and I had like a little button that turned it on, right, and I could hit that button, and if I hit it at a faster frequency, right, kind of like this, maybe like that, so it's like boop, 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 I can basically get the light to be brighter, and if I just go like boop, and only hit it a little bit and with little more gaps in between the light would be uh, dimmer right so obviously you're doing this at a much faster speed that then so as a human this is beyond our control speed so we don't to us it just looks kind of more continuous but that's basically what you're doing you're getting a different voltage by changing the uh, pulse width modulation uh, okay uh, for a given PWM, motor command is a function of the battery voltage. Our simulation thus models the battery voltage using a gray box battery model that simulates the voltage based on instantaneous power consumption. Yeah, I'm not like much of an ECE person either, but like the battery itself is also has all this extra crap in there, right? It's not, there's a difference between a perfect theoretical battery and then an actual battery, right? There's, and here they're basically saying that they're using what is a gray box battery model. I don't really know much about this. Let's look that up. Gray box battery model. 
gray box battery modeling. Oh, here we go. Wait up. ChatGPT, or not GPT, Bard gave us an answer. Gray box models are a type of battery model that combine physical knowledge with experimental data. So it's kind of a similar thing. I guess you have some, some amount of some equations, set of equations that describe how the battery is going to behave, but then you have uh, experimental data which tells you how they actually behave. Gray box models can be used to predict the performance of a lithium ion battery under dynamic conditions. Okay, I think I know why it's called a gray box. A black box model would be something where you have no idea what's inside. A gray box model is you have some idea about what's inside, but it's still a little bit uncertain. Kind of cool. Learn something new every day. The battery model then simulates the battery voltage based on this power demand. Given the battery voltage you bat and the individual motor command you command, we use the mapping for this. So the individual motor command you command would be basically, for example, uh, here in this PID, where is it? It would be this here. It would be the actual signal that you want. You find here. So your actual motor command might be this blue, right? Where you're at, here you're saying nothing, 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 and now it's like, turn the motor on, right? So you're instantaneously making that decision. So your command is basically instantaneous, but the actual motor itself can't just do that instantaneously. It has to kind of get to that position or adjust to that particular command. And that's why you have this PID controller. Uh, okay, what else we got here? Calculate the corresponding steady state motor speed required for the dynamic simulation. They've also tuned these coefficients from beta log, beta flight logs containing measurements of all involved quantities. All right, let's get a little bit more into the machine learning side of this. Policy training. We train deep neural network control policies that directly map the observation space, which is coming out of your uh, Kalman state, Kalman filter, in the form of a platform state and next gate observation to control actions you. So this is the output of your uh, control policy, which is then just being fed into this uh, beta flight PID controller. Uh, in the form of mass normalized collective thrust and body rates. So that's what it's actually outputting. Training is performed using proximal policy optimization. So this is your good old PPO, right? Everybody's favorite RL algorithm. It's a very basic RL algorithm, but it actually works quite well. But and I think it, they actually used it for the RLHF too. RL HF PPO. Let me make sure just in case. Yeah, so the RLHF uses PPO as well. Uh, but the problem with PPO is that it needs to be proximal to the policy. So kind of exactly how Giant B was describing there, right? If you as soon as you're off this policy, it's not very good. So it needs to be close or proximal to this policy in order for this PPO uh, control policy to work well. Uh, this actor critic approach requires jointly optimizing two neural networks. So the actor is going to be the policy, which is the actual control. And then the critic is going to be basically the value function, which kind of uh, tries to estimate the reward. Here they call it the value network, which serves as the critic and evaluates actions taken by the policy. And this is the type of word soup that I just feel like makes reinforcement learning more confusing, right? policy network policy actor versus value network value function critic like why do we have 10 names for the same thing uh, observation otr31 so this is telling you the dimensionality of the observation space is 31 so it's a 31 dimensional vector that's quite a lot of shit i would have thought it'd been a little bit more a little bit less uh, involved than that uh, at time t consists of an estimate of the current robot state, the relative pose of the next gate state, the action applied in the previous step, uh, the estimate of the robot state contains the position of the platform, its velocity and attitude re represented as a rotation matrix resulting in a vector in R15. Although the simulation uses quaternions internally, we use a rotation matrix to represent attitude in order to avoid ambiguities. What? I am insulted. I don't know why they don't just use a quaternion. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. The relative pose of this next gate is encoded by providing the relative position of the four gate corners with respect to the vehicle. 
resulting in a vector in R12. So 15 plus 12 plus something else equals 31. All observations are normalized. If you're doing any kind of reinforcement learning, any kind of machine learning in general, you want to make sure that anytime you're feeding something into a neural net, it's nice and normalized. Uh, because the value network is only used during training, it can access privileged information about the information that is not accessible by the policy. So you don't use the critic or the value network, which is trying to estimate your reward at inference time, right? At inference time, it's just the policy taking actions based on observations and previous actions. But when you're actually training this reinforcement learning system, the value network knows the reward. It knows the reward at every step, right? The, it's, it's, that's how you're training it. That's how you're, you're basically pushing gradients into that value network such that it gets better and better at predicting that reward. So you can actually give it stuff that's only available during training, which in this case might be stuff that's only available in simulation, right? So that's kind of another tricky thing you can do is that the value network can have a bunch of crap that's only available in the simulation, not available in the real world. Uh, for each observation, the policy network produces an action A in R4. So the actual action output is only four for each of the four uh, rotors. In the form of desired mass normalized collective thrust, we use a dense shaped reward to learn the task of perception aware autonomous drone racing. The reward R at time step T is given by this. You have four different uh, terms here. So this is kind of the reward shaping that we were uh, poo pooing earlier where a human designed pretty much all of these. You have four different terms here. You have R perk encodes rewards towards progress, encodes perception awareness attitudes such that the optical axis points towards the center of the next gate. Okay, so something that basically tries to get it to point towards the next gate. You have progress towards the next gate. You have smooth action, so you don't want it to take, uh, you don't want it to basically say, push, uh, uh, get this rotor spinning really, really fast and then turn it off, and then really, really fast and then turn it off, right? You want the, the relative actions to, to kind of be smooth. And then you have a binary penalty that is only active when colliding with the gate. Okay, so then you have an extra negative here, right? So you see how the reward, you want more reward. You want to maximize your reward. So negative here refers to the fact that uh, if you crash, you lose reward. And then here's the actual hand-designed human reward things. Note these uh, hyperparameters here, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 4, lambda 3, lambda 5. So at some point you have to decide how much more important is uh, having a smooth trajectory than a crash, right? So you have to pick some hyperparameter to do that. Uh, D gate renotes the distance from the center of mass, angle between the optical axis and the center of the next gate. Commanded body rates, hyperparameters, lambda one all the way to lambda five. Data collection is performed by simulated 100 agents in parallel that interact with the environment in a series in episodes of 1500 steps. Okay, so episodes are basically one continuous uh, execution of the policy, right? So you can think of it like one one rollout is another term that people use for this. Um, 100 agents in parallel. This is how you can train. This is why training and simulation is so much better than the real world because you can basically leverage the fact that computation can occur in parallel so you can have a bunch of agents all collecting experience uh, in parallel. Uh, 1500 steps at a 100 hertz control loop is like 15 seconds basically. At each environment reset every agent is initialized at a random gate on the track. Okay so it's not like they're always starting at the same place they kind of initialize at a random gate with a bounded perturbation around the state. Okay, so they basically initialize the agent kind of with a random orientation at a random gate, which is pretty good, right? If you're using PPO, you you want to be careful about making sure that you have data for a bunch of situations that could occur, right? So you could enter this gate with this orientation, but you could also enter this gate upside down, right? So having inform having uh data from entering that gate upside down will make you more robust to that. Uh, why my search engine has barred answers. So if you go, I think you go into like Google settings. 
I don't know if I want it, but it's basically this. It's called Search Labs. You see? Add to Sheets, add to SG, search, search for Labs, Search Labs on Google, and then basically you can turn it on. So this turns it on when you're browsing, when you're doing search, and so on. I guess I haven't turned it on in Sheets. There we go. So now it's on in Sheets. Uh, all right, what are we talking about here? Instead, we perform fine-tuning based on real-world data. The trained environment is implemented using TensorFlow agents. Dude, this is... I, I've committed to this repo, believe it or not. TensorFlow agents, that's a pretty old-school reinforcement learning uh, repo that uses TensorFlow, unfortunately. The policy network and the value network are both represented by two-layer perceptrons with 128 nodes each. Again, very small neural net here. Leaky ReLU type of activation function, kind of like a ReLU, but it has a little bit of a leak to it. Network parameters are optimized using Atom Optimizer. Learning rate of 3 times 10 to negative 4. There's everybody's favorite uh, learning rate. Policies are trained for a total of 10 to the 8th environment interactions, which takes 50 minutes on a workstation. This is a reasonable working workstation too, right? It's not, it's not that intense. RTX 3090 with 32 gigs of RAM. Residual model identification. So this is the original training and then they do additional fine tuning of the original policy based on a small amount of data collected in the real world. Collect three full rollouts in the real world. So rollouts get episodes. Corresponding to approximately 50 seconds of flight time, we fine tune the policy by identifying residual observations and residual dynamics, which are then used in training in simulation. During this fine-tuning phase, only the weights of the control policy are updated, whereas the weights of the gate detection network are kept constant. So the gate detection network, I guess, is the computer vision algo that's just kind of basically doing this pose detection on the fisheye lens and giving you the pose of those gates. Navigating at high speeds results in substantial motion blur, which can lead to a loss of tracked visual features and severe drift in linear odometry estimates. So this odometry model that they're talking about here is the model that is being run on this Intel RealSense uh, camera, right? The Intel RealSense camera has this little Movidius chip inside of it, which means that it can run a small little neural network. Uh, they're not really telling us much about this little neural network that's running, but I think that's by design, right? I think that uh, when we go up to the top of this paper, right, it's work by a academic group, but it's also supported by these uh, labs here, which are Intel labs, right? So the people in these labs are the people who are actually working at Intel, who are actually developing this camera, and they probably don't want to tell you exactly the uh, odometry model that is running inside this uh, Intel RealSense, right? What's actually running on this little NVIDIA Mobidius chip. They don't actually want to tell you what that is, so I think that's why they're not telling you exactly what this uh, odometry model is. But they're kind of telling us it's a Gaussian process. Gaussian processes are not, they're kind of very basic, to be honest. It's basically you're kind of assuming everything's a Gaussian and then kind of taking it forward in time. But I don't know, I thought it would have been a little bit more intense than that. Gaussian process fits residual position. Blah, blah, blah. Treat each dimension separately effectively using a set of nine 1D Gaussian processes to observe the observation residuals, using a mixture of radial basis function kernels. So these are these are old school. Gaussian processes, RBF. I don't know. I feel like a neural net would do better. Okay. What else we got? We're almost at two hours here, so I'm kind of trying to speed up here. Uh, correct for drift, the gates are used as distinct landmarks. Specifically, gates are detected by segmenting gate corners. <laughs> Maybe they do use the segment anything. That would be crazy. <laughs> Grayscale images are provided, and then the architecture of the segmentation network is a six-level unit. There you go. There's your unit that does the actual gate detection. For deployment on the NVIDIA Jetson TX2. So this is... Is that actually on... The NVIDIA Jetson TX2 is 
performing inference at 16-bit precision, and then one forward pass takes about 40 milliseconds. NVIDIA TX2, like I think this is, these are small, but I don't think they're that small. The NVIDIA TX2, can I see a picture of someone holding this? Does this fit on a drone? I don't know if this actually fits on a drone. These are these are small, these are edge, compute, edge computing devices, right? They're intended to be on the edge. Here we go. Is that, do you think that's on the drone or do you think that's on the side? I don't know if that's on the drone. I feel like it might be on the side and then there's a small, and then it's basically sending commands to the actual controller on the drone. But I don't know, maybe it is on the drone. It just seems like it'd be a little bit heavy. It's not on the drone? Okay, perfect. Uh, okay. But the reason they actually used it is probably because they wanted to put it on the drone, but then they realized that they couldn't put it on the drone because if they put it on the drone, it wouldn't have worked. So that's probably why they wanted to do it on there. Because uh, I think one thing that I noticed actually, where is this here? Visualizing, balancing. I had an actual thing pulled up for it. Yeah, here we go. So I found this uh, website. It's called DR Don't Drone Racing Parts, but it's basically the the actual parts for the drones, right? And it looks like they're they're actually cheaper than I thought they would be, right? Like so, for example, this is uh, a camera, the thing to communicate to the camera, and then the actual controller. But look at this controller. This thing is absolutely tiny right compare this little chip here compared to like uh the tx2 like you know what i'm saying like this is way fatter like it seems like drone racing parts are very very sensitive to the size right even just like there's actually a lot more uh suppliers than i thought there would be i thought that there might only be a couple companies like i definitely recognize TJ, dji this is a very famous chinese drone company but there's all these like random little drone suppliers here but I don't know the reason I was showing you this is because these things are absolutely tiny they're less than 250 grams yeah so I guess this is called the diatone mamba stack but look at that less than 250 grams on that versus like an NVIDIA Jetson TX2 what does it weigh Eighty-five grams. What? Oh no, that's just the CPU though. What does the whole thing weigh? What? Sixty-one grams. Okay, so maybe I'm totally wrong. Maybe it is totally fine. I thought it would weigh more than that. I don't know. I don't know enough about drones. This stuff is cheaper than I thought, though. Look at this. You can buy like drone motors are like fifteen dollars. It seems like you can basically make an entire. Uh, you can make an entire drone for like less than a thousand dollars easy here you have different five inch frame true x racing these are like carbon fiber it looks like too pretty advanced stuff yeah with the boards and heat sink I can't imagine if it weighs less than a pound Okay, uh, fuck, we're running out of time here. Um, owing to the low frequency of gate detections and high quality of VIO orientation estimate, we only refine the translational components of the VIO measurements. We estimate the correct drift using a Kalman filter that estimates the translational drift and its derivative, the drift velocity. The Kalman filter state is given by this, so here's your actual Kalman filter. There's these uh, this P term in the Kalman filter, uh, here you go, P, prior knowledge. There's other terms here. So here are all the different terms in the uh, actual formal theoretical definition of a Kalman filter. You have the state transition model, which is kind of your dynamics, observation, covariance of each of those, control input, blah, blah, blah. Posteriori estimate of the covariance matrix. So not only do you get a prediction of your state with the Kalman filter, but you also get a prediction of your 
certainty around that state and the uncertainty around that state. So you get an idea of like how much potential noise is there. So here, uh, remember how I said that when you uh, are making these common filters, you have to kind of say, what is the noise? So like how much noise should I expect in the estimate from my VIO measurement versus how much noise should I expect in the estimate from my uh, gate detector, right? Different sensors are gonna have different uh, amounts of noise, basically different variants on the prior for that, I guess is another way to think about it. Uh, what else? Common filter equations. It's a very condensed, gnarly representation there of the common filter. If several gates have been detected, all relative poses are stacked and processed in the same common filter update step. The main source of measurement error is the uncertainty in the gate corner detection of the network. So this is kind of the most noisy sensor you have. The error in the image plane results in a pose error. For each gate, the IPPE is applied to nominal gate observation as well to 20 perturbed gate corner estimates. What the fuck? So they're perturbing the estimates of the gates. The resulting is then used to approximate the measurement covariance. Okay, so they're not even they don't actually even know the covariance of the gate observation, so they're they're estimating it by using by perturbing a gate estimate. So you don't actually know how accurate or the covariance of the gate observation. So they have to kind of estimate that. I don't know. I always thought that was kind of a weird thing whenever you're doing common filters of like, how accurate is your uh, wheel odometry sensor? And it's like, I don't fucking know, right? Like, where am I getting that number? Uh, simulation results. Reaching champion level in autonomous drone racing, overcoming two challenges, imperfect perception and incomplete models of the system dynamics. I agree with that. In all four settings, we benchmark our approach against the following baselines. Zero shot, domain randomization, and time optimal. Zero shot represents a learning-based racing policy trained using model-free RL that is deployed zero shot from the training domain to the test domain. So this is no sim to real. They just train it entirely in uh, sim, and then they just throw it zero shot into the real world and see how it works. That's a good baseline. Uh... Domain randomization extends uh, by randomizing the observation and dynamics. So this is the uh, thing that I was talking about where you kind of train it entirely in simulation and then zero shot to the real world, but the simulation has weird gravity. It kind of changes the, the they add noise to the observation, they change the dynamics and so on. Maybe you change the color, change the illumination, change different aspects of the visual domain as well. So that's one way to do the sim to real transfer. And then the last one that they're going to use here, time optimal uses a pre-computed time optimal trajectory that is tracked using an MPC controller. So this is kind of your more classic uh, model predictive control. The dynamics model used by the MPC matches the simulated dynamics of the experimental setting. And again, that this dynamics model is not going to be perfect, which is why this MPC time optimal is not actually optimal. Assessed using the fastest lap time gate margin, blah, blah, blah. High gate margin indicates the quad rotor plas passed close to the center of the gate. I don't think there's a reason to do that. I don't know if you get more points if you do that or not in drone racing. Results are summarized in extended table 1C. Extended figure 1. Here we go. Extended data table 1. So here's our ablation, zero shot transfer, lap time in seconds. It's way slower, four seconds. What, is, what does the one mean? What? Training, comparison with the baselines, evaluation and simulation, gate margin in meters, completion percentage. Okay, so domain randomization and this MPC, they actually crash all the time here. So you see that 19% completion versus the zero shot transfer actually does quite well, 42%. So about half the time it crashes, half the time it 
does well. Interestingly, the zero shot is faster than the full version that they do in this paper. But the version that they do in this paper never crashes. Here you have the hyperparameters for the reward. So this is the kind of reward shaping. The discount factor is the way that you uh, push gradients into the critic or the value function, right? This neural net that's trying to tell you the reward at every single step is you basically are trying to predict the discounted sum of returns and the discount factor there basically tells you how much more important the reward is now versus the reward later. And that's usually some number like this, 0 0.99999 type thing. Uh, here you have the individual people. Speed, power, thrust. So you can see here that shaper actually seems to have much less power. So this Vanover and this Bitmot guy, they, they really push it to the limit here. They're actually just juicing it, 863. He's willing to go push the, the rotors fat, harder than even the AI. So the AI isn't even willing to go to this level of intensity and power. And the reason is that this AI is uh, has as part of its reward, right? One of these reward uh, terms here penalizes it for having too much uh, power. Usually that's a, a very common uh, part of a reward in a reinforcement learning system for robots is you'll usually have a term that penalizes very fast velocity or sudden acceleration or strong forces, right? Because you don't want the reinforcement learning agent to like basically learn some weird policy where it like kind of like floors it and then hits the brake and then floors it and then hits the brake. So uh, you can see here that's probably explaining why the this human is more comfortable blasting the uh, thrust and power than uh, the AI drone itself. But yeah, pretty cool. All right, we're right at the two hour mark. I'm going to, let me make sure this is still running on. Okay, it's still running. I'm going to do the summary and then we will end it there. Let me take a big sip of this yerba mate. All right, so today we uh, reviewed a paper called Champion Level Drone Racing Using Deep Reinforcement Learning. This is a uh, recent paper just basically out in 2023. Uh, combination of work from a University of Zurich and then a couple different uh, teams from Intel. Intel is providing the uh, Intel RealSense camera, which is a stereo camera that also has a tracking module. The tracking module is composed of uh, inertial measurement unit, and it runs its own kind of tracking algorithm inside this uh, Movidius chip. So all of that is internal to the camera. Uh, basically what they did in this paper is they had a bunch of human first person view drone racing champions. So people who can basically pilot a drone through this course of little gates entirely from vision. So they're looking inside these VR goggles and they can basically drive these drones in first person, which is pretty crazy that humans can do that. And now we have AI drones that can basically beat that. Uh, the AI drone has a little bit extra information. The AI drone also has the inertial measurement unit, right, which is inside this Intel RealSense. I think this is separate from the one in the Intel RealSense, but it has a much better estimate of its position in space, right? It, it kind of knows where it is. It has this six-dimensional orientation and position in space. It also knows its velocity and its acceleration better than the humans. Those are being passed into a Kalman filter. A Kalman filter is basically... Uh, a way to take a bunch of noisy sensor measurements of which you know kind of the maybe amount of noise for the different sensors and you can combine them into a much more flat kind of stable uh, prediction of the position. So for example, here we have the red would be the sensor measurement coming in from an IMU sensor for a balancing robot like this. And then the common filter of that would be the blue line, which, and this is showing you the magic of the common filter, which can basically smooth that all out. 
Uh, so they're feeding all of these noisy sensors into this common filter. That common filter creates an obser this state, which is known as the observation state, and now you've kind of gone into the world of reinforcement learning. You have an observation, you have an action, which is a four-dimensional output, which is basically just the force that you're applying at each of one of these four propellers, and you have a tiny little control policy, tiny, I mean it's a two-layer multi-layer perceptron, which is just a fully connected neural net, uh, 128 layers, uh, 128 neurons wide and then two layers deep. And the reason they do this is so that it can basically operate at a very fast control loop, obviously because it's running on a drone, so it needs to be quite fast. And uh, yeah, they kind of train this very basic PPO, uh, reinforcement learning algorithm, actor critic. You know, they have a reward function, which is based on some pretty standard things here. Whereas the reward function, here's a reward function. This is the human designed reward function that they're using to train this uh, drone, which has been trained in simulation and then uh, transferred into the real world by uh, doing some fancy stuff here, which they call, uh, I'm, not, I'm not even gonna go into that, but Either way, this is the reinforcement, or this is the reward, which is basically you have combination of getting to the next gate, uh, making your uh, camera kind of point to the next gate, uh, getting through the next gate, having a smooth action, and then uh, not crashing. And that combination of rewards is enough for this AI drone to learn uh, to go through this course very quickly. And it trains relatively quickly as well. So it trains on a 3090 in about 50 minutes. And there's a little additional fine tuning step there to make sure that it can transfer to the real world from being trained entirely in simulation. That's pretty much it, guys. Pretty cool little paper. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if this necessarily changes things. I don't think that uh, real world drone systems would use something like this. You know, in a real world drone system, you probably don't care about a super fast control policy. You're probably not using a control policy to actually control the drone. You probably care more about a drone that's kind of very slowly flying over something to like maybe do some kind of like uh, surveying type job or maybe it's like inside a warehouse scanning QR codes. I don't, I don't think you're gonna be running uh, drones with reinforcement learning control policies anytime soon other than for this type of weird application of racing and competitive racing but it's cool to see that you can do this uh i think i'm gonna stop there but i appreciate those of you that made it through you know uh this was a longer stream, robotic stream. Tomorrow we're going to be streaming on a, another kind of weird paper, not in machine learning. We're going to be streaming on uh, a paper that is about aliens. So there's this guy who, uh, let's see if I can go into the actual thing, but there's this guy who f went somewhere in like New Guinea or something and he like like found a bunch of like uh, spherules, which are these little metal blobs and he's trying to argue that they're basically parts of some kind of alien voyager craft so i don't know definitely cool so that's what we're going to be looking at tomorrow join if you're interested if not thanks everybody for listening thank you chris john yujun m9 hamza khalil uh giant b as always chris and sehaj everyone else khalil matthew every dream all you guys Thank you for the stuff. Hope this was interesting. Hope it wasn't too boring. And let me know if you have any feedback and drop by the community channel on Discord and suggest papers. If not, that's it. Thanks, everybody. See you guys later. And let's...